Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the AWS Loft in London, and welcome to AI Day. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be back in London, and it's uh, a pleasure as well to be opening this day where you will be learning about uh, artificial intelligence on AWS. So my name is Julian, and I'm a tech evangelist with AWS. I'm based in Paris, uh, and I actually manage to be in the office maybe a couple of days a month. But most of the time, I'm doing what I'm doing today, traveling and, and, and meeting developers and customers and helping them out, uh, helping them understand the services, how other customers use them, and what they could do with it. And we're live on Twitch, so uh, welcome to the Twitch viewers as well. I hope you can uh, hear us and see us okay. And please ask your questions. Um, so this first session today is really an introduction to deep learning. It's, uh, it's uh, not supposed to be very technical, but you know, I'm afraid I will not be able to help it. So, um, so bear with me. We're going to start with a, a short history of AI and, and, and why deep learning is uh, you know, so exciting right now. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, use cases, and then we're going to look at uh, how you can get started with AI, okay? So AI, the story so far. So actually, we have to go back um, in time. Um, the first um, discussions around AI actually start in, in the mid-40s. But um, the birth date of artificial intelligence is kind of officially set to 1956, where um, a number of a small group, about 10 or 12 um, scientists and college professors in the US, led by Mr. John Mark Carthy, met at Dartmouth University for a seminar. And they worked together for a number of weeks, and they laid the foundations for artificial intelligence, what it should look like, you know, what kind of problems it should solve, et cetera, et cetera. And those guys were geniuses, right? I mean, John McCarthy invented the Lisp language, which I'm sure some of you at least uh, have learned and maybe are still practicing. Uh, he got a Turing Award, which is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for uh, computer science. And why isn't there a Nobel Prize for computer science anyway? Uh, it's unfair. Um, and, and you know, even though it was 1956, everything they, they, they wrote, everything they came up with was, was brilliant, made a lot of sense. And you can still read it today. And the, another fun thing happened in 1956. That, that movie, Forbidden Planet, came out. And OK, you're, again, all of you are going to make me feel very old. So who has seen this movie? Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for your support. Um, and that movie is the first movie where a robot is a major character. And Robbie the robot is, I mean, you, you've all seen that guy, even if you haven't seen the movie. Right. So I like to believe that those guys in Dartmouth, you know, maybe they got bored with talking about AI and you know, they, they went for a beer and maybe they decided to go see a movie. And maybe they saw the movie and they said, yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant. That's what we should build. So I'm afraid it really didn't happen like that. But OK, yeah, I, I would love to believe that, that you know, science and fiction actually you know, uh, use it, each other for creativity. And that's the case sometimes. So let's fast forward to 2001, almost 50 years later. And that gentleman here, I'm sure you've heard his name, Marvin Minsky, is, was actually at the Dartmouth uh, seminar. Is another uh, AI genius. He also got a Turing Award. He was the founder of the MIT lab for AI. And he spent his whole life working on AI. And Actually, he was an advisor to Stanley Kubrick for the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which you all have seen, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> if not, you know, just do it this afternoon, right? Uh, no, this afternoon is my workshop, so tonight. Um, and he actually helped Kubrick design what an AI should look like, that HAL robot that, you know, again, we're all familiar with. And in 2001, so the, the actual year, uh, Minsky wrote a paper called, named, It's 2001, Where is Hell? And it was very frustrated with the fact that almost 50 years after AI had been invented, uh, that science fiction vision from the 60s <laughs> still wasn't a reality by far, right? And the, the way he put it is, no program today can do what a four-year-old can do, right? Show a four-year-old a dog, a cat, and a tiger, they get it, okay? 
in 2001, doing this with the computer reliably was a problem. Okay. So it was kind of frustrated with that. And he gave a, a lot of good reasons for um, this sad state of affairs. Right? And in a completely different world, right, on the West Coast, on the US West Coast, um, a bunch of companies started working on data in general. And well, we all know those names, right? And why did they do that? It's because, as we all know, they grew very fast. They had millions of users. And now it's, for some of them, it's billions. Um, tons of data that they gathered from web apps and now mobile apps. Um, and they figured out that it was a waste of time trying to build a supercomputer you know, that could actually crunch all of that because it was a lost cause. It, it was much better to grab commodity hardware, you know, on expensive servers that you could throw away if they broke down uh, and, uh, and just put thousands and thousands of them and actually get the job done, right? And I suppose they had pretty good engineers, all of them. And being private companies, there's this tiny detail that, hey, you know, actually, we, we, we need to make money, right? Uh, we're having fun with technology, but you know, we have a business to run. So we have tons of data. Let's do something with it. And you know, for me, it, it, it was bound to happen. You know, all those bright guys with uh, petabytes of data and a need to make money. It was gasoline waiting for a match. And in my opinion, the match was this. It, it was the, the MapReduce paper that Google published in 2004 which describe their, uh, uh, their architecture to process uh, huge volumes of data, unstructured data at scale. And the, the Google chaps were kind enough to release the paper, but they were not so kind as to actually release code, right? Uh, and I guess that's fair. So the Yahoo guys said, well, that's a very nice paper, isn't it? So let's read it. Uh, very carefully and let's write the code, right? <laughs> we have all the design principles, so let's write that code. And that's what they did. The Yahoo team implemented Hadoop and uh, released the first version of Hadoop in April 2006. So, you know, they got busy because it's only, I don't know, give or take a year after the paper was released. So kudos to the Yahoo guys for doing that. And the rest is history, right? Uh, then, you know, it, it really caught like wildfire and within two, three years, you know, Hadoop was implemented at large companies and then, you know, smaller companies and then software vendors took Hadoop and built, you know, proper distributions and, deliver and gave support to users. And now everybody does Hadoop, right? So let's keep moving uh, forward a few years. So um, now machine learning is a commodity, right? We all have machine learning on our resumes. Who has machine learning on, and Hadoop on their resumes? Come on, don't be shy. Even if, you, if, even if it's just on your resume, come on, raise your hand. <laughs> it's okay to lie a little bit, right? As long as you can actually catch up, right? But okay. So everyone does machine learning. Every company wants to do big data, and everybody, you know, it, it's like if you don't do that, you're, you know, you're, no, you're nowhere, right? So you should be doing that. But still, um, no how, no strong AI in sight. And why is that? Right? And the, the, the problem here is that traditional machine learning doesn't work when features cannot be ex explicitly defined. So let me explain that for a bit. Uh, features are uh, variables right, that you're going to use to train a machine learning model for prediction. So let me take a popular example. Let's say you're trying to predict user clicks on ads, right, on banners. So you're going to gather uh, terabytes and petabytes of log data coming from the web servers. And you're going to look at who clicks on what. Okay? And so in those logs, you're going to see you know, the time and the date and the, the user ID and the URL and the actual banner that the user clicked on if you have multiple banners on the web page, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So those features are pretty explicit, right? So the, the work of a data scientist would be to look at the 40 or 50 variables in there, maybe inject some more, and figure out which are the ones that make really sense to build an, an efficient model, an accurate model, okay? Now, let's take another example. Let's say I take a picture of this room, a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels, 
I really have, it's a really old camera. Um, but okay, that's a million pixels, it's an easy number. And I wanna count how many people are in the room, okay? So I have a million pixels. And if they're color pixels, then I really have three million pixels because I have red, green, and blue. Okay, so three million pixels to work from, okay? Three million values to work from. So are these three million features? Should I try to train um, a, a machine learning model on three million features? Intuitively, you know, if, even if you're not an expert, it, it, sound, it doesn't sound right, okay? Because none of, not all of these pixels actually matter, right? If I take a picture of this table, and I wanna figure out it's a table, do all the white pixels in the middle actually matter? Or do the edge pixels matter more, right? The shape? is actually more important than the color. So intuitively, we understand that, right? And, a, and, and even a kid would understand that. But that's the big problem here. It's solving, prob solving um, technical problems like this, which are obvious for humans, because that's how our brain works, <laughs> but very, very hard to program explicitly, to describe formally. How would you write a piece of software that knows what a table is? Right? People have been trying for 50 years. <laughs> it's very difficult. So the, 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 the problem that deep learning is trying to solve is this, exactly this. It's trying to fit into computers knowledge that is intuitive for us, informal, right? And try to get computers to learn from that. Okay, and well, the way to do this right now is to use artificial intelligence and resurrect a piece of technology that has been around since the, the 50s actually, which is called <coughs> neural networks. So this is an introduction talk. So I pro there, will no, there will be no math, no theory, no equations, you know, nothing like that this morning because you, know, you would run away and you would miss all the cool talks you know, following mine and that would be a shame. So if you want your head to spin, you can join my workshop this afternoon where we will go into more theory, okay? But I will not go into actual networks to, right now. Um, and so this technology has been around for 50 years, even more now, and, and is it a buzzword? You know, what's different? Well, it is different for three big reasons. The first one is we have very large data sets, okay? One of the key things to training a deep learning model is to have a lot of data, because as we will see later on during the demo, we feed that data all over again until we reach a good performance. So we need, we need quite a bit of data, right? And well, in the 60s, in the 70s, I mean, do you, do you remember what the largest hard drive was? <laughs> you all seen this picture, you know, the, the, the 20 guys off, uh, offloading that uh, 500 kilogram hard drive from the from the plane or from the truck, okay? So they didn't have storage and they didn't have data sets to work with, so that's a big problem. Now it's everywhere. You can just go and fetch, um, you know, terabyte, even petabyte data sets uh, from the web. The second thing is, um, it's not all about data, right? Um, the training process is really, really compute intensive, okay? Because we're going to feed that data again and again and again into the model to let it train, to let it learn. And that does involve a lot of heavy math, right? M matrix operations, <laughs> algebra, algebra operations, etc. at scale. And well, yeah, and they are intensive, right? So for a very small data set, yes, you could do it on a CPU, right? For a larger data set, if you have a million images that you wanna learn from, no way. So you need massive parallel computing. And GPUs gave us that, right? Uh, initially, we used them to play 3D games and you know, shoot each other, and, and that was a bit of fun, I have to admit. And then somebody realized, hey, uh, those things are really powerful. We could do something smarter, <laughs> maybe. We can do science <laughs> with those things, not just, not just gaming, right? And in, actually, the initial papers are uh, dated 2006 on, on actually using GPUs for um, for deep learning, okay? But it took a bit for people to actually understand it. And that's really important because state-of-the-art networks today, they have hundreds of layers 
right? So data has to go through hundreds of layers over and over again, right? And that means even more math. And, and then, of course, you need the thousands of cores that uh, GPUs bring you, okay? And the third thing is elasticity. So GPUs are very nice, but if, you, if, we have some, if we have gamers in, in the room, I know we have a few, they know how expensive GPUs can be, right? So imagine trying to build uh, your own cluster with you know, 200 GPUs to, for your uh, data science team to train and work from. Um, it's expensive, right? It's expensive hardware, it's expensive to host. They are power hogs, so your electricity bill will be quite interesting. Uh, you need to cool them as well, right? The state of the art GPUs are, you know, they dissipate over 150 watts each, right? So if you, if you have 100 of those, that's a lot of heat. So bottom line, it's going to be expensive to, to host in a data center. And the thing is, you don't, you don't need to own them 24-7. You only need them when you train, right? So you train, your you train your model on your data, you save the model. Maybe that's going to take days, maybe weeks, right? But once you're done, you're done. And, and you can use the model, and you can deploy it to something really small, like my little buddy here, Raspberry Pi. We, we're going to do that later on, right? If the gods are with me. Um, so using a deep learning model is cheap, right? From a resource point of view. Training is the expensive part. So all the more, you know, you, you should uh, just use the resources that you need for training, and as soon as you're done, release them. And cloud is a good way to do it. So what can you do with deep learning? That's, you know, technology is fun, and this is extremely fun to work with, right? But we want to get job, the job done. We want to solve actual problems. So let's look at a few examples here, and I'm going to need your help in a second. So the first one that's massively popular, and maybe some of you have already experimented with this, it's called image classification. Showing images to a, 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 a model and asking it to figure out what's in the picture, right? It's like it's the AI version of Pictionary, in a way, right? So let's look at these, right? These are from a, a well-known data set called, called ImageNet, which has you know, millions of images, and it's probably the most widely used data set for image classification training. And it has a thousand categories, right? Objects and animals, okay? No humans. So the question is, these are actual pictures from the data set. Are, so this is not the same dog, right? That's, we can maybe find, figure this out. But is this the same breed of dog? So who thinks this is the same breed? OK. Everybody gets wrong, so don't worry. Who thinks this is not the same breed? Who has no ID, <coughs> even if I gave them 10 minutes? <laughs> All right. And don't feel bad, because when I do this in the Nordics, I did it in Canada not so long ago as well. They had no clue, right? So I'm completely disappointed. I should go and do that in, in Greenland or something, right? So as a matter of fact, it's not the same dog, OK? But it, no one could explain why. And if it was the same dog, no one could explain why, right? If we had a dog expert here, it would say, yeah, come on. I've been doing this 20 years. You know, I've been breeding dogs for 20 years. This is the same dog. Why? And see, we're back to that intuitive thing that is hard to formalize. Okay. So the ImageNet data set is used for a competition every year uh, where researchers all over the world build their best models. <laughs> and they run that million images through the models. And they score how well they do on prediction, on, 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 prediction, on classification. So it started in 2010. And the, the models, the best model in 2010 had a 28% error rate which is very large, right? And that blue line goes down to 3% in 2016. Okay, and we don't have the results for 2017 yet. The red bars are the number of layers in the network. How many neuron layers did the model uh, stack up, right, to actually uh, classify? And we go from uh, none, right, just one layer, uh, to eight and then 10, and then all of a sudden in 2015, you know, it explodes, and now, you know, uh, that winner last year had over 260, yeah, 269 layers, which is a crazy number, right? So we see a correlation between, you know, the, the depth of the network and the actual accuracy, 
okay? Which, again, requires even more processing power because it's gonna be insanely expensive to train with 269 layers. So how do you think humans would uh, compare to that? Imagine um, I give you one million pictures to classify in a thousand categories, and let's assume you can maintain focus for one million images. What would be your score? Okay, who says uh, more than 10%? All right, one, all right. <laughs> you don't believe in humans, do you? Right. <laughs> I understand you, I understand you. Um, who says uh, less than 5%? Okay, who says less than three? Who thinks humans are still ahead in the race? Ah, optimists, thank you. Okay, well the actual score is 5%, okay? But it's, it's a theoretical score because once again, none of us could actually go through a thousand images and, and, and maintain focus for, for that period of time, right? Plus, you know, we'd be much smaller than a computer. So as you can see, um, for a couple of years now, and maybe that's a surprise for you, but for a couple of years now, um, AI is much, much better at classifying complex images than humans. So that specific problem is considered solved. So probably in 2017 the score will improve, but it's considered a solved problem, so we can move on to more complicated things, right? Such as these, <laughs> right? And you're the lucky ones because you actually can buy this here, right? And everybody uh, envies you, right? Um, especially in France. Okay, so uh, you've all seen Alexa, right? We're gonna use, uh, we're gonna use uh, it later for the demo too. So here we're moving on to different problems like uh, natural language processing, right? And it's much, much more complicated than just uh, mapping sounds to, to text, right? Because it's not just about syntax, it's about meaning as well. What do you mean? You know, what, what are you actually saying, right? So what should I do uh, with, that, uh, with that example, okay? Come on, let's do an example here. Alexa, what's the weather in Hawaii? Right now in Honolulu, Hawaii, it's 26 degrees with partly cloudy skies. Throughout the night you can expect more of the same with a low of 24 degrees. Oh, poor people. Um, yeah, so. A five-year-old can do that, right? I've got a seven-year-old at home, and uh, you know, he, 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 does, he speaks a few words of English, and he's already using Alexa, he just loves it. So it's the most intuitive form of communication for us, just speak and listen, right? That's what humans do normally. Um, and so the machine knows how to communicate with us and not the other way around, okay? And of course, there's an insane amount of deep learning and AI behind all of this, okay? But you just don't care. You just use that service, okay? So, you know, this is really nice. And uh, we will have sessions today on, uh, on Lex uh, and, and chatbots, and Ian is going to do that later on. And, uh, and you can learn some more about that. Uh, and here's an even uh, funnier one. It's called Amazon Go. It's a shop, it's a store in, uh, in Seattle. Uh, only Amazon uh, employees can, can go there for, them, for the moment. I was there a few weeks ago for the first time. So you register uh, with, a, with a mobile app, and then you just walk in, right? And, and, and you pick stuff from the shelves, and you put it in your bag, and you leave, right? And there are no lines, and uh, it, it's insane. <laughs> it's really, it's amazing. It's like, yeah, free stuff. Uh, all right. <laughs> and, and you get your bill maybe a couple of minutes later. So, and this is all based on AI because there are, you know, a large number of cameras on, on the top that are actually looking at, at, at people inside the store and figuring out what they take and what they put back on the shelf, etc. And, you know, being French, of course, I had to test the limit of that system, <laughs> right? And, um, yeah, guilty. And, uh, you know, I, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I literally behaved pretty badly in that store, you know, taking... Uh, four chocolate bars and like that and putting them back to and putting them in a different place and you know grabbing some orange juice and putting it back with the prepared meals etc and they started looking a little funny at me so I stopped and um, and I, I was really really confident you know 
the, the bill would be wrong, one way or the other, right? And it wasn't, right? It was, it was the exact uh, list of stuff that I picked, okay? So I was impressed. And it was very good chocolate, too, so, you know, that's, that's a win. So, again, it's all based on AI, but you wouldn't know. You just go in there and, and, and shop, and that's it. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, here's the third one we're familiar with, uh, autonomous driving. And this one comes from one of our customers called Too Simple. It's a Chinese company that builds autonomous driving systems. And just recently, um, they drove a truck, an autonomous truck, from uh, uh, Arizona to California uh, for 200 miles. You know, no driver in that truck based on you know, deep learning technology. Okay? And this is actually using uh, a technology called MXNet, which I will mention in a minute. Right? So yeah, it's, it's really cool. There's a good article on the O'Reilly website if you want to read that. So you know, it, it's coming, right? Uh, it's not just uh, autopilots and, and stuff, which are really, really great. It's also you know, moving very fast, right? Um, no pun intended, uh, into, uh, into actually no drivers at all, OK? So Yuma to San Diego is a lot of desert. <laughs> it's a lot of straight lines, too. But it's already impressive. So what about you? Can we get you started on AI, right? Well, I think we can. Because we have a lot of customers doing that already. People keep asking me, what's the future of deep learning? And I say, well, you know, I'm not, I don't know about the future. No one knows. I know about the present. And, and the present is this. Um, large enterprise and startups um, and, and, and public sector too um, applying um, AI at different levels to just make their business smarter. right? And I'll give you some examples as we go. So it's real. If you thought it's a buzzword, nothing happens, there are no projects, <coughs> there are no deployments, there are no customers, well, sorry. You know, we do have a lot of customers on, on AI in general. But before you actually start, there are a few questions. Right? Um, the first thing is, what should I do with it? <laughs> Good question. Uh, and my best advice would be, what's the hardest problem that your IT has failed to solve, right? Because remember what we said earlier. We said it's very difficult to write programs that would learn that uh, informal knowledge. So if something has been failing over and over again, right, if you've been banging your head against the wall with a problem, then maybe it's time for a different approach, right? Anything that has to do with language, anything that has to do with translation, anything that has to do with um, extracting information from audio, video, et cetera, text, right? Something that, you know, you, you just can't, you know, you can't grasp that problem, right, with, with a traditional approach. Then deep learning might be a good candidate. So then, should you go and actually build it from scratch, design a model, train it, et cetera, et cetera? I'm going to show you that in a few minutes. Well, if you have the expertise, sure, you can do that. If you have the, the proper skills and the data set and, and the time and the budget to build that, then please do, right? Like the two simple guys, but it's their core business and they've got you know, uh, a lot of very bright people working on this, okay? So it's, it's, worth, for, it's worth it for them okay, to invest into that because that's their main competitive advantage. But for other companies, maybe that's overkill. And I guess for many companies, that's going to be overkill. So the next step up would be, OK, let's not design a model. Let's not train it. But maybe I can reuse a model. right? Maybe I can pick a model as, that has already been trained on very large data sets. And you can find them on the web. And I can adapt those models, fine tune them, as, as, as it's called, to my data. And that's a really big time saver. Okay, Why not? Or maybe you know, I really want uh, something even simpler. And maybe I just want to use a SaaS service for that. Okay, just, I want to call an API and get an answer, and, or, like we do for Alexa. right? We don't want to know what's happening behind that. We don't want to know <laughs> all the deep learning wizardry that happens. We, we just want to speak, and we want to get answers. right? That's it, so SaaS service. And when you think about it, if you guys uh, were, were around at the time, um, these are the exact same question as big data. I remember in 20, um, uh, 2009, 2010, when we started working with Hadoop, 
these were the same questions, right? And of course, <laughs> we all did what we were expected to do, which is, yeah, let's build it ourselves, right? Let's buy hundreds of servers. Let's deploy Hadoop, zero dot, whatever that was at the time. <laughs> well, very unstable. And, uh, and yeah, we're, we're going to figure it out. Come on, we're software engineers. And for a lot of companies, that went really, really bad, right? And it, it created uh, the notion that, yeah, big data, you know, big data is useless, big data is just marketing hype, and you cannot do anything with it. And some companies just, you know, dropped it, only to realize a few years later that their competitors <laughs> had not, and that was a problem, right? So another piece of advice I could give you is, you know, please uh, do not rush into building everything yourself. Maybe you're making that mistake all over again. So try to figure out, you know, what exactly you need from AI. Can you find it? Uh, can you find enough off-the-shelf solution? And if yes, please do that. Um, if not, you know, then start building, okay? But do not rush into building, okay? You will probably be disappointed. So that's the stack that we have today. Uh, we have those top-level services. I'm going to go through them really fast because, again, Ian is going to cover them in great detail later on, and I don't want to uh, steal his thunder. Uh, and Below that, we have um, um, managed services that allow you to do uh, managed machine learning with Amazon ML or manage Hadoop, manage Spark, etc., using uh, Elastic MapReduce. So services where we take, uh, we, we take the, away the pain of actually building the infrastructure, managing it, etc., uh, and you can just deploy your applications and, 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 and work with them. Okay? So it's a little less involved. And then uh, lower down, you can actually build everything from scratch using one of those open source libraries, right? Like MXNet or TensorFlow or Cafe or all the others, Keras, etc. But okay, please keep in mind this requires a few skills, and and you know there are many ways this can go wrong too. So you should only go there if you feel confident that you know you have the skills and the time to invest uh, in, in actually building from scratch. Okay. And then, of course, at the lowest level, we have infrastructure, CPU instances, and GPU instances to crush, uh, to crush, yeah, yeah, to crush, um, to crush all that data, to crunch. So, just a few words about those three services. So, Lex uh, is a chatbot service. You can build chatbots with voice uh, or text uh, conversations, and it's fully managed. So, uh, as you will see later on, you focus on defining the interaction. Right, the conversation, and you totally ignore any infrastructure. Right, it's all managed for you. So you define that conversation, you deploy it to an API, and then you can integrate that in a mobile app, in a web app, uh, on the Facebook page, on your Slack channel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so it's a really, really high-level service where, uh, again, just like Alexa, which of course you know it's the same name because it's the same tech. Um, all the complexity, all the deep learning aspect is completely abstracted away, and you just focus on defining your conversation. Okay. The, the second service is Poly. So Poly is text to speech, and you know why it's called Poly, right? Here, yeah, it makes here it makes sense. In every other place, I've explained it, but not here. <laughs> okay. So it's text to speech uh, in uh, 24 languages and 48 voices. Okay, so male, female, and we have a few children as well, children voices. And it's as easy as it sounds. Build your text string, send it to an API, get a sound file in real time, which you can play or the, which you can um, uh, store and reuse later on. And the last one is recognition. Um, so recognition is um, image classification, uh, face detection, face comparison, etc. Again, just an API call. Let me just give you an example here. Um, there's a TV channel in the U.S. called C-SPAN, uh, the, and they, they show uh, all, the, all the debates at the, at the Senate and at the, at the Parliament, the U.S. Parliament. And of course, they have thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of archives. And they want, the problems they wanted to solve was uh, we want to be able to find all the talks that Senator X gave. So imagine trying to solve this with a traditional approach. OK? Very hard. So they used recognition to 
can through their thousands of hours of archives and, uh, and using you know, pictures of all the senators and all the, all the politicians, they were easily able to locate them everywhere. And it was fully automated. And they, they, they were able to uh, index their whole archives. So now they're able to find, OK, we want all the talks from this senator between you know, 2012 and now. And bim, they get the answer. Right? Doing, and they used to do this manually, if you can believe it. OK, so recognition is a huge boost for them. So going down a little bit, uh, if you want to build, right? Uh, if you want actually to build a service, then you could use MXNet, which um, AWS uh, endorses and supports um, and, and builds with. OK, so uh, I'll go a little quicker here, because you know, we're going to focus on this this afternoon as well. And I'm not supposed to be too technical this morning. So MXNet is an open source library with um, um, an API available in multiple languages, like Java, uh, JavaScript, or uh, um, uh, Python, uh, C++, et cetera. And it allows you to design and train and, and use deep learning models. Okay? And it, it's, it's quite friendly. Okay? And let's go to a quick demo of this. Uh, we're going to work with a data set called MNIST, uh, which is a, a data set of 50, uh, 60,000 handwritten digits. And the game here is to find out you know, what digit the picture actually uh, uh, corresponds to. Okay? And uh, you know, in a nutshell, how, how, you do, how do you do this? Well, a digit right, is a 28 by 28 pixel image, grayscale. But you've seen the matrix, right? So if you, if you dive into the matrix, it looks like this, right? It looks like pixel values. So black is a zero, and white is 255, and gray is everything in between, right? So we do have 254 shades of gray, right? That's better. Uh, yeah, computer science, man. So this is what a picture looks like to a deep learning model. So we're going to take those uh, pixel values, fit them into a model, and see what happens there, OK? So let me switch to my console here. <coughs> And let me reconnect to my instance. OK, here we are. Can you see OK in the back? Yeah? All right, thank you. Oops. So let's look at something, the simplest thing. OK, so don't worry about the code. Just focus on what we're trying to do here. So the first two lines here, we're loading the data set. OK, so we're loading those 60,000 images in memory, and we're going to run them into the model. The model itself is this bit, right? So here, can I catch it? Yeah. So here, in about seven or eight lines, we define the multiple layers in the model. So we have an input layer, which we call data, right, where we're going to show our images. Um, and then we have two neural layers. One with 128 neurons, and the next one fully connected to a second layer, 64 neurons. And then the output layer is 10 neurons, because we have 10 categories, right? We have 10 digits. So we're going to get 10 probabilities, one for each of the digits. Right? Hopefully, one of them will be 1, and all the others will be 0. But does this ever happen, right? Uh, and then, basically, whoops, sorry about that. We match, you know, we uh, associate the data, we bind, that's the word I was looking for. We bind the data to the model saying, okay, in this model, I'm going to show this data set, okay? And then I'm running this, okay, for a number of times, which we call epochs. So here I'm going to use 20 epochs, I'm going to push that data set 20 times all over again into the network and see how it goes. OK, I'm saving some of the samples for validation, right? So at the end of each epoch, I will see the actual score. And I'm saving the model. And this is 31 lines of Python code, right? So you can do deep running in 31 lines of Python code. So if you feel inclined, just get started. Let's run this. So this is running uh, on my, uh, on my uh, instance in AWS. And here I'm just using that CPU on the instance. I'm not running this on GPU. And 
It's quite fast because it's a small data set, so each epoch takes less than a second, and we can see accuracy going up, right? So we can see that the model actually learns how to correctly predict those images. And in a few seconds, right, okay, we run those 20 epochs, and we get to 95% accuracy. So sounds good. Let's try it. Let's challenge it. And so what I did, of course, is I drew my own digits with my favorite paint application, right? So these are mine samples. And they're, they're ugly, because try to do this with a mouse, right? And yeah, I made them a little uglier than necessary, especially the nine. And I'm going to take those images, and I'm going to run them into prediction, OK? Which is a few more lines of Python. And so let's see the scores. So for each image, we get 10 probabilities, right? So the first image says, well, there are 56% chances this is actually a zero. And the second image says, yeah, 93% chances it's actually a one, right? Do you have my pointer here? Yeah. OK. And that's the two, and that's the three, and that's the four. And as you can see, you know, we're very far from that uh, it's all zeros and ones thing, right? So that model is not great, OK? And it actually gets the nine completely wrong. So it thinks, it thinks the nine is actually zero, one, two, three. It mistakes my nine for a three. So that's a bit disappointing, right? So that's because my model is not good enough. So we can design smarter models, OK? And it's exactly the same story. But here, I'm using a more elaborate network called a convolutional neural network, CNN. I'm sure you've heard that before. And it, let's stick at saying that they are really good with images. OK? And I'm going to use GPUs for training, right? OK? So I'm going to use three GPUs here for training. And this is all I have to say. I don't have to mess with the low-level GPU programming, which is quite difficult. So let's do this. And while this is happening, let me power this on. So here, you know, it's going to take a little more time, right? It's going to take three seconds per epoch with three GPUs. If you run this on, on the same CPU as I did before, it would take about a little less than a minute per epoch. So using GPUs gives us a very nice speed up. Okay, and you can see accuracy shoots up immediately. You know, we're already at 99%. Okay, so those, this model is really good at, uh, at uh, predicting images. Okay, so let it finish. Let me connect um, to my buddy here while it's finishing. All right, we're almost done. And we can see, you know, we're getting to 99 plus accuracy. Okay, it takes longer. It's more involved process, but thanks to GPUs, we still manage uh, to get this done really quick. So let's predict. So I'm using the exact same uh, prediction uh, program. I'm just changing the models that I use, right? So this shows you how you can actually load a pre-trained model. It's one line of code in MXNet. And let's predict again. And this looks much better, right? We actually get to see zeros and ones, OK? And even the ugly 9 scores 99.7% as a 9, OK? So it's like this is the my hard view on MXNet, but this is how you do it, right? You load data, design a model, train it again and again, measure its accuracy, fix it, fix it, until you get to the, real, uh, the, the right accuracy level, right? OK, and now it's time to put it all together. OK, so this is what I'm going to show you. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So it's a combination of AI, right? So I'm going to talk to my Echo device, which implements all kinds of crazy deep learning that I don't even know about. Yep. It's going to send a message through AWS IoT, 
right, which is our uh, IoT service. Uh, I use the, uh, the Dublin region here. And this message gets to my robot here. And based on the message, it's going to do one thing or the other, hopefully. And it's going to use poly for text-to-speech. It's going to use uh, recognition for images. And it's going to send tweets. Okay. And it's going to use MXNet as well. So let's try this. Alexa. <laughs> let's get this out of the way. Alexa. Alexa. Open Johnny Pie. Johnny Pie is at your command dot. What would you like him to do? Please go forward. OK. Please move forward. OK. Turn left. OK. Go forward. OK. Go slower. OK. Go backward. OK. All right. Stop. Thank you for interacting with Johnny Pi. Goodbye. OK, so here, you know, I'm talking to that robot. Yeah, it's not R2-D2 yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. OK, and this you know, just works, right? So fine, that's the echo, and the echo is great. Now let's do something else. So who wants to be on Twitter? Alexa, open Johnny Pie. Johnny Pie is at your command dot. What would you like him to do? Look at faces. OK. So here. Eight faces have been detected. Oh yeah. OK, so eight faces have been detected. Right, That's Polly speaking, based on information sent by recognition. OK, so I'm calling, yeah. If you have privacy issues, I can, uh, I can delete them. No worries. Um, so I'm calling recognition, getting all kinds of JSON information from it, and using that to highlight the faces and build a text message that Polly can, can actually speak, right? So it's nice, but I'm still using the cloud, right? So I'm still using all that cloud-powered AI to actually get the job done. Can I actually use MXNet, something that runs locally, to do sim something similar? So of course. Um, let's try this. So I apologize, this is not a cricket ball. Okay. But if you give me one, I'll be happy to use it for my demos. So here I'm going to uh, use MXNet to take a picture with the robot. Uh, so I'm going to take a picture with the robot, and I'm going to use MXNet locally with a pre-trained model to recognize that image. Hopefully it's going to work. Alexa, open Johnny Pie. Johnny Pie is at your command dot. What would you like him to do? Do you see an object? OK. So let's look at the logs. It's always good to. 99% sure that this is a baseball. OK, it's 99% sure this is a baseball, right? So here I'm using a pre trained model uh, uh, trained on ImageNet with 1,000 categories. So that's the actual output from the model. It took 3.2 seconds to do that prediction locally. It's a Raspberry Pi, it's a very small computer, but it's only three seconds. And so the baseball scores really high. Who knows what a thimble is? I have no idea. I have to look it up. Uh, but it's a very low score. Uh, you'll tell me afterwards. And, uh, and of course, we should have a tweet, right? OK. And can we do a lot? OK, let's do another one. More challenging, because there's a background this time. Alexa, uh, open Johnny Pie. Johnny Pie is at your command dot. What would you like him to do? Tell me about the object. There was a problem with the requested skills response. OK. <laughs> open Johnny Pie. Alexa, open Johnny Pie. Johnny Pie is at your command dot. What would you like him to do? Do you see an object? OK. So probably I used words that didn't make sense. I'm 20% sure that this is a microphone mic. 
Okay, so we're 20% sure it's a microphone, which is a pretty good guess, right? Because uh, I don't think ImageNet has ever seen an echo device. Okay, and it only sees a piece of it, and, and you know, there's plenty of other stuff in the background, but we, we make a pretty accurate prediction anyway, right? So, um, so this is an example of you know, putting all those pieces together, uh, I would say SaaS level AI, right? With poly and recognition, um, plus um, I would say low level uh, AI using MXNet, a pre-trained model, and you know, bits and pieces of Python. So you can definitely combine those, okay? Uh, so this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to conclude, you know, we hear lots of stuff about AI and um, uh, some scary stuff, some silly stuff. And uh, just to close this presentation, you know, I want to uh, share a few thoughts with you. So I really wish that machines will learn how to understand humans, right? Uh, I, I'm old enough to have seen Star Wars when it came out. And, and I, I distinctly remember that you know, C3PO speaks uh, six million forms of communication. And, uh, and that's what we should build, right? Um, so we should build machines that understand this natively. We, we shouldn't have to learn how to talk to machines. It's such a pain. Um, call me an, an idealist, but you know, it's, uh, you know, maybe it's going to help us understand each other. Uh, I don't know if they will end up ruling the world, but I would say with this guy, probably not, but you know, who knows uh, where we'll end up. And whatever happens, you know, you're gonna build it, we're all gonna build it, and it's gonna be fascinating. And I'm just paying tribute to my master, Isaac Asimov here. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, I think now we're gonna move to questions. Thank you very much.